This video is the second last in the series about acute inflammation and we'll cover ending the acute inflammatory response and the various mediators of inflammation that we see. We move through these first three steps of the acute inflammatory response, which are recognition of the inflammatory stimulus, recruiting leukocytes, and removing or killing the inflammatory stimulus. And now we're moving on to controlling and ultimately ending the response. So this video is covering why the acute inflammatory response comes to an end, the mediators of inflammation involved in initiating and regulating inflammatory actions, as well as a review of the complement system, which plays a role in both stimulating inflammation, opsonizing cells, and even killing them. Inflammation declines after the offending agents are removed simply because the mediators of inflammation are produced only in rapid bursts. They exist only as long as the inflammatory stimulus is present. They have short half-lives and the inflammatory mediators are degraded after their release. Neutrophils, the primary white blood cell seen in acute inflammation, also have short half-lives in tissues and die by apoptosis relatively quickly within a few hours after leaving the blood. In addition, as inflammation develops, the process itself triggers a variety of stop signals that will try to actively terminate the reaction. These active termination mechanisms include a switch in the type of metabolites produced from pro-inflammatory leukotrienes to anti-inflammatory lipoxins and anti-inflammatory cytokines. Now, mediators are substances that initiate and regulate inflammatory reactions. The most important ones are vasoactive amines like histamine, lipid products, these are things like prostaglandins and leukotrienes, cytokines which include chemokines, as well as products of complement activation which are mainly C3A and C5A. And these mediators are either secreted by cells or generated from plasma proteins. The cell-derived mediators are normally held within intracellular granules, which means they can be very rapidly secreted. Histamine is an example of this. Or they will be synthesized de novo, which is another way of saying made from scratch, in response to a stimulus. So these take a little bit longer to be produced, but these are things like prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and cytokines. The major cell types that produce mediators of acute inflammation are the sentinels that detect invaders and damages in tissues. These are cells like macrophages, dendritic cells, and mast cells, but things like platelets, neutrophils, endothelial cells, and most epithelia can also release some of these mediators. Active mediators are produced only in response to various specific stimuli. These stimuli include microbial products and substances released from necrotic cells, and this requirement of microbes or dead tissue as a stimulus ensures that inflammation is normally triggered only when and where it is needed. One mediator can also stimulate the release of other mediators. For example, products of complement activation can stimulate the release of histamine, and the cytokine TNF or tumor necrosis factor acts on endothelial cells to stimulate the production of another cytokine, interleukin-1, as well as many other chemokines. And lastly, most of the mediators are short-lived. You don't want them floating around for a long time after the need for them has been eliminated. This helps ensure the inflammatory response is active only as long as the inflammatory mediators are being produced. And the first of these mediators to be discussed are vasoactive amines. The two major vasoactive amines, which have their name because they have important actions on blood vessels, are histamine and serotonin. These are stored as preformed molecules within cells, and they are among the first mediators to be released during inflammation. Histamine is stored in mast cell granules and can be released by degranulation in response to a variety of stimuli. Histamine can be released by binding of antibodies to mast cells, which occurs in the immediate hypersensitivity reactions or allergic reactions, and can also be stimulated by products of complement. Histamine causes dilation of arterioles and increases the permeability of venules. It's considered the primary mediator of the immediate transient phase of increased vascular permeability, producing interendothelial gaps in venules, as discussed in one of the previous acute inflammation videos. Arachidonic acid metabolites are the next set of mediators, and prostaglandins and leukotrienes are the lipid mediators produced from arachidonic acid present in membrane phospholipids. These mediators stimulate vascular and cellular reactions in acute inflammation. And starting off with prostaglandins, these are produced by mast cells, macrophages, endothelial cells, as well as other cell types. And these are involved in the vascular and systemic reactions of inflammation. In addition to their local effects, prostaglandins are also involved in the pathogenesis of pain and fever in inflammation. And I just remember that P in prostaglandins is for pain. Leukotrienes, on the other hand, are produced by leukocytes and mast cells and are involved in vascular and smooth muscle reactions and leukocyte recruitment. They cause intense vasoconstriction and bronchospasm and can cause an increase in the permeability of venules. And their ability to increase vascular permeability is much more potent than histamine. And I remember this little fact by thinking of them as leukotrienes instead of leukotrienes. Lipoxins are also generated from
from arachidonic acid metabolites by the same pathway that make prostaglandins and leukotrienes, but actually unlike those previous two, which enhance inflammation, these lipoxins actually suppress inflammation by inhibiting the recruitment of leukocytes. And they actually inhibit neutrophil adhesion to the endothelium and chemotaxis. So this is preventing those white blood cells from making it to the periphery of blood vessels, migrating through and then heading towards the inflammatory stimulus. And also to note, drugs designed to counteract prostaglandins and leukotrienes often inhibit the enzymes that produce those substances, or they'll block the receptors that leukotrienes and prostaglandins actually act on. Next are cytokines and chemokines. Cytokines are proteins produced by many cell types, mainly things like activated lymphocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells, but can also include the endothelial, epithelial, and connective tissue cells. And these proteins mediate and regulate immune and inflammatory reactions. Chemokines are proteins that act as chemoattractants for specific types of leukocytes. Their two main functions in acute inflammation, the inflammatory chemokines are the ones whose production is induced by microbes. These chemokines will stimulate leukocyte attachment to the endothelium by acting on leukocytes to increase the affinity of integrins, which are the surface molecules on leukocytes sites which will actually stick them to the vessel walls and allow them to come out of systemic circulation. They also stimulate migration or chemotaxis of leukocytes in the tissues to the site of infection or area of tissue damage. And it's actually quite difficult to produce antagonists that block the activities of these proteins. So these aren't something that are targeted as often in anti-inflammatory medications. Two of the predominant cytokines are tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-1. As already mentioned, they both have critical roles in leukocyte recruitment by promoting both the adhesion of leukocytes to the endothelium and their migration through vessels. These cytokines are produced by many cells, but mainly by activated macrophages, lymphocytes, and dendritic cells. Some other cells that produce them include endothelial, epithelial, and connective tissue cells. The secretion of these cytokines can be stimulated stimulated by microbial products, immune complexes, foreign bodies, and physical injury, which are all forms of inflammatory stimuli. And their roles in inflammation include endothelial activation. Again, this activation causes an increased expression of adhesion molecules in the vessels, which is an important step for moving white blood cells from systemic circulation into a localized area within your tissues. This endothelial activation also causes increased production of various mediators, including other cytokines and chemokines, growth factors, and increased procoagulant activity of the endothelium. These other cytokines produced are also important for the activation of leukocytes. They augment the responses of neutrophils to other stimuli, such as bacterial endotoxins, and stimulates the microbicidal activity of macrophages, partially by inducing the production of nitrous oxide. And interleukin-1 can activate fibroblasts to produce collagen. And finally, these cytokines are important for the systemic acute phase responses associated with infection or injury, which include fever. In these cases, TNF regulates energy balance by promoting lipid and protein mobilization and by suppressing appetite. So sustained production of tumor necrosis factor can contribute to cachexia, which is a pathologic state characterized by weight loss and anorexia, which is often or at least sometimes seen in chronic infection and neoplastic diseases. And an interesting note, TNF antagonists have been very effective in the treatment of these chronic inflammatory diseases. However, these patients often become susceptible to mycobacterial infection due to the reduced ability of macrophages to kill the intracellular microbe. Another important component of the inflammatory response is the complement system. And this is a system of soluble proteins and membrane receptors that function mainly in the defense against microbes and in pathologic inflammatory reactions. In total, the system consists of more than 20 proteins, some of which are numbered C1 through C9, although they mostly care about C3. Complement proteins are present in inactive forms within the plasma, and many of them become activated to turn into proteolytic enzymes that then degrade other complement proteins. This forms an enzymatic cascade which can undergo tremendous amplification. And then lastly, the critical step in complement activation is the proteolysis of the third and most abundant component, which is C3. So what activates complement? The cleavage or activation of C3 can occur by one of three pathways. The first or the classical pathway is triggered by the fixation of C1, which is another complement protein, to an antibody like IgM or IgG that has combined with an antigen. The alternative pathway, which can be triggered by microbial surface molecules like endotoxin or lipopolysaccharides, which are components of bacterial cell walls, complex polysaccharides, cobra venom, or other substances. Basically, this is a pathway that doesn't require an antibody binding to an antigen for activation to occur. And lastly is the lectin pathway. 
and this is where plasma mannose binding lectin binds to carbohydrates on microbes and directly activates C1. If you can recall from the earlier phagocytosis and clearance video, specialized protein receptors or lectins will bind to very specific carbohydrate patterns which are found only on the surfaces of various pathogens like bacteria, viruses, or fungi. Now, all three pathways of complement activation can lead to the formation of an active enzyme which splits C3 into two functionally distinct fragments, C3A and C3B. Now, the functions of the complement system in inflammation, C3A and C5A are products that stimulate histamine release from mast cells. Recall that histamine will increase vascular permeability and cause vasodilation. These can also opsonize microbes. C3B, when fixed to a microbial cell wall, will act as an opsonin and promote phagocytosis of that microbe by neutrophils and macrophages. White blood cells have surface receptors for these complement fragments, so basically when they see these complement fragments stuck to something, they see it as a big eat me sign. And then another function of the complement system is cell lysis. The deposition of the MAC or membrane attack complex, which is formed by multiple complement proteins, can deposit on cells and actually make these cells permeable to water and ions, which results in lysis or death of the cells. This is most often seen on microbes with very thin cell walls, such as the Neisseria bacteria, and deficiency of the components of complement predisposes individuals to Neisseria infections. So just a quick review of the actions of the principal mediators of inflammations. Vasoactive amines, which includes mainly histamine, mean they are responsible for vasodilation and increased vascular permeability. Arachidonic acid metabolites like prostaglandins and leukotrienes, these are involved in vascular reactions, leukocyte chemotaxis, as well as other reactions of inflammation, and these are antagonized or opposed by lipoxins. Cytokines are proteins produced by many cell types. They usually act within a short range, mediate multiple effects, and are mainly involved in leukocyte recruitment and migration. The principal ones in acute inflammation are tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1, and chemokines. And then lastly, complement proteins. Activation of the complement system by microbes or antibodies leads to the generation of multiple breakdown products, which are responsible for leukocyte chemotaxis, opsonization, and phagocytosis of microbes or other particles, as well as cell killing.